Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani Moray, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. And welcome to Bespoken Bones, Ancestors at the Crossroads of Sex, Magic, and Science. We're in the business of healing trauma, connecting with our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. I'm your host, Dr. Pavni Moray, and today it's my pleasure to welcome Sobi Wing. Sobi uses he, his, him, they, them, their pronouns, is a multiracial settler connected to the global majority, living on stolen, unceded Coast Salish territories of the Muskeem, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. He is president of the Katara Filipino Indigenous Arts Society and chair of the Cross-Cultural Protocols Working Group on Youth of the Youth Passageways Organization. And throughout their organization, they have youth-led workshop labs in rave culture called Love, Sex, Intelligence, opening physical and digital spaces for peer-based focus towards multi-amory relating sexuality and sacred sexuality. They have also, throughout their adult life, been involved in environmental education, permaculture design, and are currently part of the Indigenous Food and Freedom School. A maven of moderating and curating online forums, Sobi has been generating a multitude of groups on Facebook focusing on decolonizing love, decolonizing consciousness, anti-colonial solidarity, decolonizing travel, rites of passage, and many more. And during the COVID-19 period thus far, they have been active with the Philippinex Global Network hosting web ceremonies and sessions focused on ancestral resistance and cross-cultural panegyusa, which is solidarity. Sobi has Scorpio Sun, Gemini Moon, Cancer Rising, Mercury in Scorpio, Venus in Virgo, Mars in Libra, and I highly encourage you to check out more about Sobi and his work on his Instagram account, uh, which is Sobi One, and I'm going to spell it. It's S O B E Y O N E on Instagram. So, hi Sobi, welcome to Bespoken Bones. Thank you, and Maayong uh, Adlao. Good day to everyone. Great. Does it, um, do you want to start with a prayer? Sure. I will bring a prayer that comes to me from Mary Joyce York, uh, and it features um, various Visaya Tagalog, Pangansinan, and Bicolano deities. So um, begins to Mother Laolan. May you bless the hardworking farmers, take care of the lands, but receive very little. May you bless and feed those who are hung, poor and hungry with little to no food to eat for themselves and their family. To mysterious Maguayan, may you guide us during the darkest hours, our journey across the seas to faraway places, and during our last breaths before our voyage to Sudlat, and back to the loving arms of our ancestors. To brave Apo Laki, may you give courage and strength to those fighting to survive as a warrior on the battlefield, both in and out of the homeland, and to the person struggling to live in this harsh world. To loving Lakapati, may you bless all those who face judgment from people who deems them as wrong, for being who they truly are. As a proud trans woman, a proud trans man, and to protect them from harm. To beautiful Dian Masalanta, may you bless those in love, those who have trouble giving birth, have lost a child, and to help those in need of love from neglect and abuse. To Luminous Halia, may your strength and radiance protect all women from what they may face every day, 
even in the dark nights, as you light and guide them under your moonlight. Thank you. Praise. Thank you for that. I want to talk a little bit about, um, I think it's always nice to just start with where you are personally, what your experiences are personally, and, and kind of give folks a, yeah, just an entrance into what it's like to be you in the world, especially as, um, as someone who's living with a multiracial identity. And I'm just curious if you want to talk about the experience of that and what that what that means to you. Well, I've had some reflective time uh, being in this global pandemic, um, 94 days of being able to really just sit with myself and um, steer the boat where I want to go. And uh, a lot of that has to do with, uh, has been, has been able to reflect on the uh, way I see myself and the way I want to, to be in the world. And the world events have shaped that in a lot of ways, um, have stirred things up, um, you know, particularly towards um, the racism that has been flaring in lots of ways. And uh, the, uh, the ways that my peoples have been affected, uh, frontline workers who have been in the care fields uh, and the nursing fields, and uh, my own mother, her career was as a nurse. And um, I, I look at uh, the ways that being with my Philippine community particularly has bolstered me during this time and and has been a way for me to be able to feel a sense of um, strength and purpose. And each day I start my day with uh, connection with my ancestors and light candles to them, light our our sacred plants to offer those prayers up. And I have a multitude of diasporas uh, within myself that uh, are reflected in my altar and I I am able to to feel the presence of those multitudes despite the fact that I might not know all the names on those family trees that are connected. Mm. Uh, I can only trace back maybe you know, with a few generations. But I, I see that looking back on my life, I have absorbed into my, my being many of the different spiritual traditions and practices and uh, just researched a lot of history and context for those practices. And that's an ongoing thing that I feel has become embedded within me is this desire to uncover those roots and um, has found me participating in groups like Katara, Filipino Indigenous Arts Society, that allow me to uh, share in that work with other people and practice um, some of the arts that we are relearning and reclaiming that uh, we weren't taught as, as uh as children growing up because of Christianity, because of mm. the colonization. And so decolonizing has become a big part of my spirituality and has helped me to also reckon with the, the colonization of um, that I've been complicit in supporting through just being a settler living on stolen lands from the places where I was born to where I have settled here in the current uh, unceded Coast Salish territories. And taking that understanding of who I am to 
considering my accountability to this place and bringing with that um, some of the the richness and the the beauty and the struggle that uh, defines the history of my people across the many diasporas that I contain within myself. So that's uh, a little bit of how I've, you know, walked walked this land in terms of uh, my my path and where it's led me to different places in the world and is ongoing. And uh, I still consider that there's so much I have to learn and, you know, I, I feel like I'm not in any way an expert. I'm a lifelong learner. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious if you want to talk a little bit about um, the arts, because I was really curious when you said that, of the traditional arts that you didn't get to learn, but now you are learning. And um, yeah, if you'd say a little bit about I mean, what are you learning and how is it and um, what happens when you practice those traditional arts? I was brought up with various martial arts growing up, and that's been something that did begin to connect me with my culture and I didn't even realize it at the time Um, you know that when I was learning uh, judo and karate that uh, I actually have a small amount of Japanese lineage and um, that was only recently that we did a DNA test for my father and and learned that Uh, kendo another one we I learned and later, you know, Kung Fu I learned. Um, and then in more recent times, I've been able to find uh, teachers of Filipino martial arts, which uh, weren't that readily available. You know, and traditionally those were taught through family. Um, and, uh, you know, I would maybe relate to the the purposes of defending one's people against raiders and um, and that sort of thing. And so, the martial arts uh, is is special in the sense that um, it is is taught through the weapons, uh, the edged weapons, and that trains us to have our bodies become a weapon and uh, develops a strength of the whole being through how we learn with the the edge of the blade and the, the ancestors would have had a knife that they carried, which uh, is very much um, connected to their spirit. So it's not just uh, uh, something that is used to inflict violence, but it is to instill in us a sense of uh, strength and, protection as we move through dangerous terrains uh hunting or you know we we face the uncertain conditions of the world around us so today it's not so possible to just walk around uh, with a with a machete or like a, a sword um but we still are able to connect with that sense of our warriorship even if we carry a pen. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah, it's that kind of art that is one of the things. Uh, we definitely, in our society, play uh, musical instruments that come from, especially the southern Philippines of Mindanao, um, where the indigenous people, um, the Lumad, uh, continue to, to live as they have for thousands of years. Um, Despite uh, despite the um, influence of the modern age, and they um, also you know have their their clothing designs, which uh, we've been given permission to to have with us, and um, the dances. Yeah, I'm curious if you like. I, it's well, I just wanted to name that um, my ancestors are are bladesmiths. And, um, and so for me, there's been this really beautiful, resonant, 
like somatic knowing thing. I don't even know how to put it into words about like making blades, right? And I, I just wonder if, uh, if for you there it was something similar. Like you said that you were, you were learning martial arts, and even before you had an awareness of of your ancestry being from Japan and or part of it being from Japan. And um, yeah, just like on a body level. What are you noticing that's happening when you're um, when you're practicing? Well, it's a very practical system. Um, I mean, I've, I've tried different ones. Um, I really, I like I like something about all of them. But what I'm really appreciating right now, especially during this pandemic, is that whenever I'm I'm practicing this, um, it instills in me a sense of um, alertness, aliveness. Mm. expressiveness and um it's it's helping me feel like i'm i'm bringing back something that was in my bones you know that something yeah. that yeah. i'm retraining an awareness that has been with me um and it's uh it's a system that absorbed many others like it's it's an amalgamation of the things that came to the Philippines, so it's it's also that um, sort of innovative technology that I really appreciate, and and it applies itself to any time and place that it's in. So it's not a static, uh, stagnant, you know, system. It's mm-hmm. one that lives and breathes with, mm-hmm. as does all indigeneity. Yeah, I just I think it's really amazing of that that feeling of aliveness that you're talking about when we connect on that body level with the things that our our ancestors did, right? When we eat their foods or listen to the music that they listened to or touch things that that they held or you know that there's just that imbuing of um continuity, you know, it's it's really beautiful to me. Tell me a little bit about um rites of passage and your own, maybe your own experience um, with going through rites of passage and then leading into how you've been involved with that movement. Yeah, I was uh, raised Roman Catholic. So I felt that during that time, that ritual uh, was something that I picked up on very strongly. I was a choir boy in my elementary school years and uh, i was an altar boy and you know at a certain point as i reached adolescence i began to question the the religious uh aspect of it in its in its uh general form like i you know i i guess i i was opening myself to the question of you know what else is there and um later i would learn that my my grandfather on my mother's side also had that moment of curiosity despite the fact that he remained a roman catholic his whole life but there was a period of time that he went away from um his family and and just uh went into this this period of exploration and i i spent a period of time like looking at different religious uh, traditions, visiting temples and mosques and sitting with Sufis and went late till much later pieced together that like many of these, most of these traditions were all something that I may have had uh, crossed in my ancestral pathways. And so the ritual aspect was something that as I entered um, my youth, I began to focus more strongly on that and and began to explore it in terms of magic uh, from the Western uh, magical traditions and uh, from the indigenous traditions. I would go to various ceremonies uh, that I could partake in. Um, And then I gradually entered into a youth culture um, as a a raver as a uh, Mm. person who was finding community through dance music and beats and DJs and all night dancing on full moons and equinoxes and solstice where we were 
exploring that intersection between um, you know paganism and what we were doing, experiencing community in that way. And I would say I was definitely complicit in a lot of cultural appropriation and um, in that I wasn't you know so aware of that you know even if I was drawing upon something that I might have had an ancestral connection to, I maybe didn't see that connection quite yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just sort of seeing that there was like this world of, of, uh, spiritual traditions that were, were easy to discover and to, to make use of and to replace that Christian imprint. Mm -hmm. Um, but going back to that moment when I left Christianity, there was this distinct, um, event that I wanted to mention where. I was invited to a uh, a ceremony in one of the parks in Toronto, and it was um, a place where they held uh, what was called a ball dance, which I've yet to find where this comes from, but um, I do know it's, it's it's some tradition somewhere where they suture into their skin these uh, weighted bells and um, a front of the back of the body and the drummers play, and you dance until these bells rip from the flesh. And um, I was just going as a witness. Uh, I knew some friends playing the music, the drumming, and when I got there, I noticed that I recognized some of my one of my schoolmates who was like a grade older than I. And something in me just caused me to feel like I had to be a part of that ritual. And I'm not, uh, you know, the thought of having something pierced through my flesh, uh, you know, didn't and having to dance till it rips out, uh, you know, was, I'm not, a, I'm not someone who'd be drawn to that kind of pain. But it was an undeniable feeling, and I, I, I ran up this hill away from the gathering for a moment just to sort of collect myself and try to understand what it was that made me want to participate. And when I got to this, the top of this little hill, I found this feather that um, just, I, it made me stop and, and, and connect with it. And I you know my last name is Wing, and I always kind of consider feathers as something to, to notice. And, yeah. um, mm-hmm. and that's when I kind of knew I, I had to participate. And so I did. And uh, it wasn't a small motion that would cause these things to rip out of your your skin. It, you had to really dance. And um, so when I did eventually see these things or feel these things come out, the uh, the pain snapped me into a trance. And I just remember like, being held by people as they guided me to a place where I could uh, just uh, sit down and not have to uh, not be falling down. And some words being spoken of just, just listen to the drums and you're, you're safe, you know, but I couldn't open my eyes. I was just um, somewhere. But that for me marks a moment in time where I separated from that religion of Christianity. And later I would learn that the state of trance um, is a very uh, defining characteristic of, of people in the Philippines. Uh, they call it sepi, the tendency towards going into trance. And um, later I would discover that, uh, you know, that, that this is something that happens where, you know, people not only go into trance, but they will sometimes bring through spirits that speak and commune with the living. And then, you know, in the rituals that I would be uh, connecting with, I would find myself utilizing ritual to create that sense of connection and community that I felt was was hard to to grasp and, and find. And it has led me through my life towards um, various communities um, who share a purpose and eventually 
as I've said in a you know a sweat lodge, I I credit those indigenous ceremonies as the ones that really you know helped me ask the question of like who are my own ancestors. When I when I'd hear them pray to their ancestors, it kind of awakened in me, I think, something. Mm. And you know, fortunately, in my journeys back to my homelands, um, I serendipitously encountered indigenous peoples who um, I was able to experience their intact traditions of uh, ceremony. And um, I began to inquire deeper into what, what were my own specific regional indigenous ceremonies, because those were largely lost to the assimilation into Christianity. Yeah, so that's uh, a little bit about how I've um, got into this realm of rites of passage. Uh, rites of passage is, uh, you know, as Darcy and another of your podcasts spoke about yeah. it, you know, it's, um, that's a, a European term and uh, translating into rituals of, of passage that were observed, you know, during the New World um, colonization. But uh, they, what I was taking note of about all of that was that um, the universal aspect of that uh, does point towards something that could be something that unites us as, as human beings, as a human family. But the way that they were taken from us I later began to realize held the seeds of the the real uh, work that is involved to become that human family, to heal all the trauma that was created in the process of removing those rituals of passage, removing those caretakers of those rituals, and uh, largely women, and replacing them. So the recovery of those is how I look at it now. And I, I kind of see, I call it more like rights of decolonization. And um, with it comes protocols that protect those rituals from succumbing to those tendencies of appropriation mm. um, and redirect people to uh, looking at who their ancestors are. Yes, and what their responsibilities are to the ancestors of the places that they are doing these rituals on, especially on stolen lands. Yeah, the youth are a big part of that, and I think about um, all the movements that are happening in the world, and that you know, if we start from that place of the children and the youth, that intergenerational ladder, I like to look at it as you know, going all the way to to death and uh, the eldership, uh, we, we have a whole system of ways of redressing these uh, colonial traumas and wounds and bringing back, um, not in the, you know, in the precise way that it, it was in its ancient times, but in a way that draws from that, that connection to land. Mm -hmm. It's calling to mind, um, something that I read that Krishnamurti wrote about education when he's talking about that the it's not that we have to educate people for, for freedom, right? It's that we have to protect the freedom that they have at birth and that if we can do that, right, then, I mean, it's basically like a lot could be taken care of in one generation, right? I think is what you're saying. If like, if the if the young folks are um, protected and the rituals around them are protected, then it's it's like what be the world that becomes possible is really different. And but that also means like I don't know. I feel really excited about COVID. Actually, not COVID itself, but I feel really excited about like maybe school is going to be not school anymore. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but like there's something about that of um, not putting our children into these facilities that are prison-like, um, but encouraging them to be in the world and, and learn what they want to learn. That feels really exciting. I agree. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we may not be able to see the school systems completely uh, collapse and and be easily replaced. But I mean, I I've been participating and trying to be a part of the, uh, especially since the recent um, Black Lives Matter influence around education, uh, addressing anti-blackness uh, and. Um, and racism in, in education, um, seeing ways that that can expand into some of what we're talking about in terms of ancestral pride and, and everybody learning about, you know, these histories of how, how we've all been sabotaged from mm-hmm. embracing who we are and that leading into, you know, some of the forms of racism we see where people are seeking identities and perhaps white supremacist ways and ways that harm, you know, and it's, it's uh, something that I'm seeing right now with uh, the homeschooling movement in particular, where they're really looking at, you know, decolonizing curriculum and education Mm -hmm. and looking at history in a way that has been uh, neglected uh, from the perspective of pre-colonial perspectives and understanding the, the ways that, it was altered through the uh, colonization. You know, one of the areas that it's it's uh, really important too, in terms of the education, is you know the sexual education, and you know in terms of that coming that's... of age. I feel like that's that's something that's always been underserved in the school system. Completely, yeah. And not only that, you know, even like amongst families, they have little ways of addressing those things and again going to our ancestors um you know in my case i've been able to see that there's there's a lot that uh we could learn about you know how how we were before we were um brought into these patriarchal and misogynist influences that we see still alive today and uh know the, the ways that rape culture is is perpetuated and so i feel like that also is a part of the initiation that we need to consider is like how do we be in right relations with each other from that standpoint yeah i completely agree with you because it's it's my sense that it's it's not that you know i i um, am the parent of two teens right now who are teenagers right now, just to give some context that I'm not just like talking out my butt. Uh, I mean, I might be talking out my butt, but I also am deeply interwoven with the lives of, of two young people who are finding their way. Um, and it's my sense that it's not that they're not being initiated, right? It's that the initiations are um, are fraught with the, the stuff that you're talking about, right? They're just they're unwholesome and unwell and initiations into, um, I mean, they're, they're serving their function, right? They're, they're designed to serve a function, which is to numb us and to like help power get imbued in certain ways and not in other ways. And, you know, it's just, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting socialization process to watch. And even as, you know, I having a lot of conversations with my younger child, um, right now about it, who just turned 16 and she is, she sees it so clearly, you know, and she has language for it because we've been talking about it since forever. Um, and yet it's still, it still happens, right? Like she still is sometimes struggling with, um, the socialization, even though she can see it. It's just, yeah. Would you be willing to, um, to speak a little bit more about the, that place of intersection for you um, with healing sexuality um, through this ancestral connection or through ancestral practice or consciousness or awareness or kind of like how, like how you've rewritten that script. Yeah, I'm still in that place right now. Um, But what I would share is that I, I feel blessed by my ancestors in the sense that when I was able to research and dig a little bit, um, well, a lot, it's, this was not easy to find, 
um, I was able to find that um, according to the accounts of the, the Spanish friars who were the ones who uh, are, provide the, the written um, histories, so we, we had oral traditions uh, primarily, um, that the, uh, you know, at first their, their take on, on what they witnessed was that this, that there was a lot of savagery and, um, that, that people were like animals and that they, they were very sexual. And that was one of their first impressions. And, uh, that was to be subdued. And they did, you know, they, they, they had the haircut because they they knew that that was a way to tame their spirit, and um, they made them feel shame mm-hmm. about the way that they behaved. Whereas uh, prior to that, sexual intercourse was regarded as beautiful and natural, and nothing to be shamed about. And uh, you know, by today's standards, um, they might even consider that uh, you know these people had a predisposition towards kink and you know the 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 status that was imbued in 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 those societies revolved around you know whether for the the male-bodied people if their if their penises had uh were adorned with a certain um piece of jewelry that actually would connect with the women's female body parts in a way to like connect them and prolong their sexual act so it seemed like they really favored prolonged you know intercourse in a way that wasn't about just procreation but was definitely about you know the pleasure in in the way that the that that uh acted in in the in their um use of those and there was also uh, something really beautiful, I think, about how they viewed the orgasm as um, something that uh, the word for it is kalu uh, al hatian, which is um, also a term used for the place. Wait, sorry, can you just say it one more time? Because it broke up a yeah. little bit. Kalu al hatian which is a term used for the place we go in the afterlife. So similar to heaven. So gorgeous. And uh, Yeah. So this was just to give a sense of how, you know, how they, they placed a similar value to that experience. And to go from that to, you know, another uh, snippet that I, I came across where terminology that began to emerge from the the Spanish as well, where they they described um, acts that were translated as uh, sinful in the sexual act, um, and, and uh, the term neki kilawas, you know, denotes a male focused sex act translated as he copulated, he urged to sin, he tried to sin, and he requested to sin. And then it, it goes into uh, variations of that where, you know, napa hilawasia means when the woman has fallen, has sinned, had carnal act, has consented to sin. And then naga hilawas kami when they had sex together and it's an admission on both parties that they had sex and defined as we have sinned. So the way that they've, um, you know, introduced this narrative of like this fall from grace kind of thing, um, shows that there was this, um, this way that it was, that the shame was brought into the, the culture. And, uh, I feel like the unspelling of that is, part of the magic that needs to happen and that I've been trying to reckon with in my life because I feel like uh, I have had to define my own sexuality in terms of how I, you know, I feel a lot of aliveness and joy around it. And that was not something that I learned um, Mm. through my upbringing in Christianity 
but that I'm reclaiming now and have been reclaiming. And it's something that also, you know, has to reconcile the, the ways that, um, unbridled sexuality without consent, without, uh, that, that consideration of other can lead into rape culture and things that are not, that don't really, you know, they're not something I want to, to carry with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and looking at how the, uh, the Spanish influence of that sort of, um, patriarchal influence has, has played out in giving men, uh, a way of, of being that I don't feel is really helpful to to me today to be able to like um, relate with women and uh, non-binary people. It's something that requires for me now to also you know go back in there and uh, create spaces with other men where we can work on that and and be able to undo those kind of uh spells that have been put upon us it is a putting upon for sure right yeah and it and it and it takes that level of unspelling of um dispelling those those embodied narratives those practices the and what they serve the the what they are in service to yeah ultimately and something I wanted to touch upon, uh, I know we're getting t- short on time, but just that, um, you know, at certain points I was really wanting to learn about Tantra and mostly what I could access, you know, was the Neo Tantra, which is, you know, mm-hmm. very white centered, very coupled with, um, multi billionaire, billion dollar industry around yoga and, um, yeah. has to be, you know, that has to be looked at, you know, in terms of the, the impact that has had, especially on South Asian people who sometimes are under, underserved in how, you know, the, the rest of the cultural appropriation is being looked at, but should really be, you know, looked at more, or scrutinized more closely. And that's something I've been looking at in terms of how that, that culture came to the Philippines and how there is evidence that those tantric traditions were being utilized in the places where my ancestors were. Mm. And I, Super I feel cool. like I've not been able to completely get to that place where I, I feel like that's a big part of my practice, but I have at least the starting points of looking at that. Yeah. And I feel like that is something that, uh, you know, all cultures can do is, um, you know, look at their own ways of how s- sexuality was sacred within their own ancestral lines. Yeah, there's also like the, because I, I think that those things are so obfuscated in the literature, right? Often. Um, and there's also that muscle of like remembering and asking your ancestors, right? Like, how how did you do that? How was sex sacred to you? Like, so even if folks can't find it specifically in the literature, I think there's other technologies to remember those things and to um, because like I I my sense of what you're talking about is the um, the right alignment of sexual power of using being in um, relationship with sexual life force energy in a way that is uh, holy and also um, wholly consensual, right? That there's a there's a balance of uh, of shared power in exchange in erotic exchanges, whether it's with oneself or with another or with the earth or you know with other many others. It's just that there's the um, yeah, there's a way to hold that power that's just and uh, and like a shared justice around it. And yeah, I just want to like let folks know that that's like it, I think at the at the deeper levels of ancestral connection and somatic practice where those things intersect, like that information is held in our bodies. Like we can we can remember. Um, and I think research is always good too. Yeah. So B, I want to um, just check in with you because I know you have, you do, a, oh my gosh, you do so many things, right? Astrology, ethno-autobiography, 
culturally rooted rites of passage, men's accountability, entheogenic integration work, dream work, indigenous food sovereignty work, and just, um, yeah, just wanting to see what you are really inviting folks into right now. Well, um, yeah, by the time this podcast is released, uh, the um, consulting um, group that I'm part of with Youth Passageways, which is an organization that supports the coming of age of youth across many different uh, modalities and different organizations that are found throughout the world. Uh, we're going to have within Youth Passageways uh, a consulting uh, collective that is able to work uh, amongst itself, um, but also serve uh, a, a broad spectrum of, of needs. Um, so in terms of perhaps some of the things we've talked about in terms of crafting um, rituals when it's, it's not easy to, to access uh, those practices, uh, we can perhaps help guide people in a good way towards those things. Um, know that also considers how to how to be in right relations with the indigenous p- people and lands that they're they're living on as well and um, that's also something that I will be continuing to do in my own um, Katara indigenous Filipino art society uh, with specific focus towards uh, Filipinos and um, helping them, also connect with the homeland, uh, something that I'm working towards with uh, the, the goal that I have of uh, applying and becoming a, a dual citizen, which is something I'm able mm. to do, and uh, being able to help uh, help people that are returning to the homeland do so in a way that has a lot of um, benefit, not only for themselves, um, and but also is in harmony hopefully with you know people that are living in the philippines who need to be involved in that relationship as well yeah i also continue to build upon my astrology practice Uh, i'm i'm pretty pretty uh adolescent in my practice right now but i can definitely help uh open up that that language for people to begin their own um, journey into that. Those are uh, the ones I wanted to speak to, I think. Yeah, thank you. You just really want to thank you, Sobi, for um, all that you're doing and the ways that you are uh, really focused on decolonizing love and desire and healing and just thank you for your work and thank you for your time to come on Bespoken Bones and talk about this. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank all the people in my life that have served as uh, as guides, teachers, and allies in this. Um, be too many names to to name, but I would want to name the Center of Abilin Studies and uh, Lenny Strobel and... Um, Lily Mendoza and um, all of the, the current uh, core members, um, named uh, Mira Melaluca, who um, has helped me think about the South Asian uh, diaspora and, and people in India and how these tra- traditions uh, are relevant to them, and uh, Lucayo Estrella in the Philippine diaspora too, as well, who. Um, is definitely a, a guiding light for many of us and just all the ones I can't name right now. I just want you to know if you're listening that I, I'm so thankful to have uh, many positive influences that uh, strengthen me in the, in this world. It's beautiful. Thank you for that inclusion of, of those folks of lineage. And I just want to thank you again. And thanks to everybody who's listening to this episode with Sobi Wing. And if you have felt inspired by anything you've heard, I encourage you to check out Sobi's Instagram, Sobi One, S O B E Y O N E. And um, thanks for listening. 
we are also revamping our Instagram account. So check us out on Instagram at Bespoken Bones. And I'm Pavani Moray. This is the Bespoken Bones podcast, and we will be back every full and new moon with more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. Mm-hmm.